Thanks. Can we hear each other? Is it okay? Okay. So, um, thanks for the lovely introduction. Um, as some of you may know, this is my third DevFest Gorky. Um, this, sh this year should be the best year so far. And um, actually, my presentation is different each year. It's a different technology, and I'm always trying to pick something that's interesting for developers, but something that's also uh, maybe difficult for people to understand or boring to get into or they just want someone to do all the hard work. So this year uh, we're doing a talk about building and publishing Android libraries. And as you may know, um, this is a very, very interesting topic in our Android world. And actually, I have the slides already prepared. There's a link, so I'm blocking the link. So here it is. So if you want to follow um, if you want to follow the presentation on your phones, you can do it here. Okay, so um, this, is, this is actually what I mean by doing Android libraries the proper way. Uh, when you're building a library for the community, uh, for other developers, so you want to provide them with something like this, so it can be easily accessible and easily uh, integratable into their apps. And um, basically, we're going to talk about how you can do this um, by the book. There are other ways, but I'm doing the one that's considered to be by the book. So agenda is just to quickly run through open source and Android community, what it all means, um, to talk about distribution channels for our libraries, and how to set up everything, and how to configure your project so that you can publish your libraries to the world. And um, just a little bit of talk um, about how you can integrate this with your CIs, with build systems, so on. And in the end, I'm going to talk about the silver bullet solutions for those who may not know what silver bullet means. It means like just one click solution to the problem. Um, and the main goal of this talk is basically to inform people uh, on how Android libraries are built and maybe inspire people to create more community-built libraries. Um, so first question is, why would we open source anything ever? Well, I talk about this a lot with other developers and people in the community. And this is one of the two things they always tell me. So it's basically people are afraid that other developers will steal their code. And I mean, first of all, that code, it's it's probably not that good. Like it, everything can be improved, uh, but also if you're afraid of people stealing your code, you can choose a correct license. Um, other developers will join you, and then you will feel like you're sharing with them, and not uh, you won't feel like they're stealing from you. And the other thing is, people say that there is no value in open source, and usually that means like no commercial value, which. I disagree with like these are fully open source companies and these are some of the technologies that we have today that are open source but with specific licenses that allow people to use their products um, in a certain way so that the company would benefit in the end so let's just quickly go through what what, it, what this means so proprietary software allows you uh, to get software that works out of the box. It has premium support. You can contact the company that built the software for you. Um, and also, you get regular updates. When something is broken, you get the fix in the next couple of days. And with free or open source software, this is a bit more difficult, but you, have, you still have support, but it's coming from the community, so like Stack Overflow and stuff like this. Um, you get the software free, but usually they ask you to provide some attribution like thank you or uh, in your about page to say which open source libraries you used, stuff like this. Um, and it's usually customizable. So any open source software can be forked with a proper license again, and then you can change it however you want. Um, it's a very good thing. So Android is somewhere here in the middle, which is interesting, uh, but Google has to keep Android as their um, trademark. So. So your community is here to help you. And your community is 
you can find them in various places. So like the official blog and Stack Overflow, uh, popular newsletter, um, then Reddit, XDA if you're interested in more um, lower APIs, and then um, Android Dev on Twitter, and also Google Plus. Google Plus is shutting down, but um, still it's a very lively community there. And yeah, of course there are conferences. And um, basically what you can, like I, I spent a lot of hours researching this, and what I found out is that the community already knows how to do it, but it's not all in one place. So the thing is, I'm presenting this, and I'm hoping to just show the basics and like an overview of what uh, building Android libraries looks like. And I have this talk as a blog post. So don't worry if you lose some, some of the information. I will give you the links in the end, and you can read everything like slowly at your own pace. OK, so let's go into Maven repository. So um, basically, Android libraries are published to Maven repositories. They actually host your binaries, documentation, reporting, sources, whatever you want to deliver to, to your uh, potential users. Uh, it's based on the POM, which is a project object model. It's very popular in the Java enterprise world. And uh, basically, it's all of projects information in one place. It's very useful for um, categorizing projects inside of a Maven repository. So the two most popular servers are Maven Central. It's being maintained by Sonatype. And JCenter, it's being maintained by Bintray. And also, there are third-party Maven repositories. You can also use your local machine, or you, ha you can have your network setups in a way that you have your own Maven repository somewhere. Um, one interesting thing would be to mention Jitpack. Jitpack is a really cool way of doing this. So it basically invalidates my whole talk and does all of this for you. But there are downsides. In my experience, it was not as reliable as Maven Central and JCenter. It is also restricted in a couple uh, locations, like China, difficult to get through Japan as well. Um, and also some enterprises Companies that are that have very strict security measures, they only allow Maven Central, for example, or they only allow J Center. So it's very difficult to distribute to everyone um, if you're trying to uh, get as many people as possible. So it's very difficult to distribute to everyone, and Maven Central and J Center can do this. Jitpack is really cool, but still it's difficult to reach. So uh, my talk is focusing on Maven Central and JCenter. And that's the reason. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, you can see, the, you can see the, uh, how Gradle setup looks like. So the left one is um, setting up the Gradle plugins for the build. And the right one is setting up uh, dependencies for each of the modules. So you can have probably, have, you can probably have the same uh, in both, but you actually depends depends on where your sources are and what you're building. If you're building a Gradle plugin, then your users will use the left side. If you're building like an Android plugin or Android library, Java library, then your users will be using the right one. So it's different, but you can target the same repositories. Um, okay, so the idea is to make your code accessible from everywhere. And let's see what it takes to do this. So what, what are you building? So there's an APK file. It's a binary for Android libraries. It's basically Java code and your Android resources, signing, all of this. Uh, there's JAR, which is a standard Java library. It can also be signed, but it's only Java sources, or today Kotlin sources. Uh, it, it doesn't contain any Android resources. And then there is an AAR. You may have seen this. So it's basically JAR plus Android resources. Um, it's not an APK, but it's not a JAR. So somewhere it's in, it's in between. And you're publishing an AAR. It's short for Android Archive. Um, another important thing to note is each library is identified by its Maven coordinates. So it goes like this, group ID, artifact ID, and then the version. And usually we 
specify the version as major number, minor number, and patch. And you can see this like all, all across the industry. Everyone uses this. So if you're building an Android library, please use it. It's very friendly. Um, and then another important thing to note is Maven is categorized using the POM, and you're using Gradle to build your libraries. So it's a bit different, but in the end, you can generate all of the same information from Gradle as well and get the POM uh, from it. So there's a plugin that does this. Um, I will talk about this a bit later. So basically, you need an Android library module. It's not an app module. It's a library module, and it's an Android library module. It's not Java or Kotlin. And you need to specify POM details, which identifies your library in the Maven space. And then you need to have a Sona type account to allow you to publish stuff to Maven Central. And you need to have a JSON, Bintray account to allow you to publish to JCenter. So these are the main two repository uh, servers that you want to publish to. You need accounts for both. And this is how deployment works. So locally, you have three tasks. You compile your sources. Mm. You package your Android archive. And you generate your POM. So you identify your project in the Maven space. And then remotely, you need to sign your project digitally. So it's done with GPG signing. If anyone is interested in security, we can uh, talk about this after, after the talk. But it's pretty much out of, this, out of scope for this talk. Um, the, another thing is to publish to JCenter. Like all, all that you did locally, you need to publish it to JCenter and then you need to sync to Maven Central. There is also a way to directly publish to Maven Central, but it's much easier this way, and also you get your library accessible in the two most popular repository servers. Mm. Basically, we can get into um, what's required to set up all of these accounts, so that's your first step. So Sonatype is a company that's maintaining Maven Central, and um, you need to have a unique Maven group ID. Group ID is usually like your website dot com, and then you can just switch it the other way around. And it basically guarantees, if you own the website, it guarantees that nobody else will use this. If you don't own the website, then you might be risking that someone else uses your website uses your Maven group ID, and then you can run into problems. Um, you need a new Sonatype account, obviously. And this is a weird thing. You need to create a Jira ticket for Sonatype support so that they can create an account for you. So um, it's very weird. It takes a week. And you can basically do uh, other stuff while they approve it. So this is what it looks like. You just create a Jira ticket. They respond. Um, everything is okay, and you need to just tell them it's fine. I managed to publish. It's, it's the way it is. I don't know why, but it's like this. So while they uh, verify your account in these seven days, you can set up your Bintray account and play with it. So you, can you need to create a new open source account. So it's usually paid, but if you select open source, then it's free. It's usually like this. And um, you create a new Maven repository, which is only your, in your account. So it's not public yet. So it's only in your account. And you create a new package for each library and keep the same group ID. You link your Sonatype account, and you need to configure your signing. So it's, this is confusing, I know. Um, this is what the page looks like. It's not something out of this world. It's you know, just normal um, web UI. What's, what it looks like, really, is like in your bin tray, you create your own repository. You create a new package for each library that you're building. And then inside, you publish your libraries. In Sonatype, when it gets synced over to Maven Central, you have this group that you own. And then inside, you have a package and a library. So it's a bit different. 
And as I said, if you lose track of some of this, I have this written as blog post, so don't worry. You can read through it at your own tempo. But it's kind of confusing, and unfortunately, there is, I haven't found a nice, easy way out of this. So you have to do it. But the good thing is, you do it only once. So when you configure it, um, you can configure it in any way you like. But this is, let's say, by the book. So you can configure it like this, and it will be, uh, it will work out of the box. OK, so configuring Android project. So you lose a lot of time trying to figure out what's not working in your Android project. And unfortunately, it's usually something that you have no control over, like Cradle, uh, Android tasks, updates, Android SDK. Um, it's pretty much the same here. So it's dealing with Gradle. Um, basically, you need uh, an existing app module and then a new library module. You can do this without the app module. You don't actually need it. But it's really nice to have it if you're publishing an open source library. It's really nice to have it because then you can show people how you use your library inside of a real app. And also it serves as a demo if someone wants to run the APK and try it themselves. So the thing you're publishing is only the library module. And before starting, um, it's a good practice to have the library module the same as your artifact ID. So if your library is, a, I don't know, red spinner, and it's nice to have the library module name called also the red spinner. Uh, all API classes must be public. Like everything you want people to use, don't forget to add public in front of it because they'll import the library and they won't be able to use it, which is really annoying. It happened to me. And API must be 100% documented because you will get issues. People will complain and they will downvote you or something bad will happen. But just document everything and then they can read through it. People actually read the documentation when they need a solution. So, um, yeah. And one more thing, this is extremely important. So, like AppCompat, Kotlin, all of this stuff, it's external dependencies. If you, if you use it, just be careful because people uh, may use a different version of AppCompat, a different version of Kotlin, different version of whatever you're using. So just you know, take care and write this into your readme so that people know which version you're using. If you want them to use any version they want, then you can't um, include your AppCompat into your library. You can just say um, that it's provided by the user. So. Oh, it's just important stuff to note when you're building an Android library because people really complain. Like, I've dealt with many complaints, so this is how I got this. Mm. So the, um, there is a plugin. As I mentioned before, you need a POM to register in the Maven space. So there is a plugin that actually does this for you. Um, you need a POM document. You need to publish sources. You need to publish documentation. You need to manage versions and so on. Um, there is an automated solution. It's called um, Android Gradle Maven plugin. It's built by Daniel Belland, and um, you can find him by this handle at GitHub. Um, it's, I think it's the only one actually that does this for Gradle. And also you need a Bintray plugin, so if you're uploading uh, to your Bintray repository, you need a plugin for this. And it's actually also, it does a lot of other things, but it's also an automated solution. It's actually provided by Mavis Central directly, um, uh, actually by J Center, and you can find them by this handle at Bintray. So when you configure your Android project, you'll need like there is some work. You need to edit your Gradle files and so on. And I have all of this uh, already prepared in separate files uh, that I published online. It's on GitHub somewhere. And I will give you the links, but I just want to show you, um, show you like the most interesting things that may people may miss. And I've lost a lot of time, so um, it's interesting to see what what can go wrong. So the goals of um, having um, like an definite automated solution that does all of this for you. Um, is to make your life easier and you have a, like one click and everything is set up. But you need to accept that, like you may know in Android world, it's not like this. It's never like this. 
So there is no real silver bullet solution. You can, you can have like a semi finished solution, but not like fully done that where you can just one click and that's it. Um, basically what we want to do is keep this as simple as possible. So all configuration for the project needs to be external, like in separate files or somewhere um, in, in one of the scripts. So not thrown around in like seven different script files, which th that would make it really hard to maintain. Um, so m also we want to make version changes as trivial as possible. So if you're publishing 2.7.5, we want this to be as easy as possible. And then also keep everything secure because Maven Central is checking how secure your library is and JCenter is checking how secure your library is. And you need to be, it, it needs to be um, signed and all of this. So we need to keep security um, at high level. Um, one more bonus thing is we want to keep, we want to uh, make publishing and testing possible from CI, so like Jenkins, Travis, Circle, whatever. So we want to keep this as a possibility. And I'm just gonna quickly run through this because it's a lot of information and it doesn't really uh, make sense to uh, try and make you remember, but um, just to show you interesting things um, about each of these files that are required to actually publish a library. So um, packaging and publishing script, it's one script, and it basically generates POM, packages everything for you, uh, collects your secure data for signing, uploads to Bintray, syncs to Sonatype. This is basically the meat. And I have this as one file, it's also published. So it's one file that you include, and let's say it's the only thing that you really need. Other stuff is just making things easy to maintain uh, for the future. It's one, actually two Gradle tasks. So this is, uh, these are fun things to note. So uh, you apply these two plugins that I previously mentioned. One is for generating POM, one is for uploading. And you configure your project like this. It's pretty straightforward. And you also configure your signing like this. It's also pretty straightforward. So you just um, have configuration in one file and you're done. So there are some secret properties like your password, username, credentials, and um, you can have this, have them all in one file. And it's really easy to maintain, but just make sure that you don't upload this file to GitHub because then everyone will have your uh, credentials. And basically you configure it like this. It's easy to configure. Um, so project properties are like um, license, developer information, where, where they can contact you, the link to your GitHub project if you're on GitHub, uh, POM data like um, which issues can be reported, contribution, rules, stuff like this. Like I also have this as a file so you can just uh, modify it, make it work for your library. And it's basically like this. You just specify the license, specify the name, uh, the RF artifact ID, what, who are you, uh, your name, your email, it's also straightforward. And um, then you have to configure your uh, project. So if you have one app module, one library module, that means three Gradle files, one in the root, one in the app module, one in the library module. So let's quickly go through them. Um, you configure your Gradle plugins, you configure your version codes, um, looks like this. Ext is a shortcut for externally available properties, so they are available in all other modules. Once you define them in the root module, they're available everywhere. This is what I was talking about when I said that you need to keep all configuration external. So you just change it here, and it changes for your library module, for your app module, and also generates this version number into the POM and uploads this data to your uh, Maven repository. And uh, the library module, this is probably the most important one. You need to include the publishing script and you need to double check the dependencies. So everything that you build, um, this is where the information comes from. And you can go to, it's normal like Gradle module. You use these external dependencies that you defined in the root and 
you also need to apply this script. I mentioned this script before, so it's basically a one file solution to this problem. And um, if you want to publish also your app, like a demo for your library, um, you can configure it easily. You need to just include the library project to test it, demonstrate all the features, uh, show as many different variations um, possible, and then sign the library if you're going to publish it to GitHub. But this one really isn't important if you're not demoing. It's nice to have, but it's not super important. Um, yeah, and then if you're using Travis and you're using an emulator, this was a fun thing to note. Uh, their emulators take about 20 minutes to start up. So you need to specify this in your Gradle script and uh, this will keep the job alive for about 20 minutes so that the emulator can start up. And then when you have configured everything, you just run uh, clean and install. Install is actually coming from one of these plugins. It builds the library, generates the POM, generates all the data, generates um, documentation, packages everything in a place where the uploader can use it, and then you run bin tray upload. So once you configure your project, every time you want to publish a new version, it's just one line of change, which is the version number. And you run these two tasks, and that's it. So it's difficult to configure, um, difficult to set up, but in the end it's very easy to maintain and very easy to publish. And this can automatically sync to Maven Central. So if you upload to Bintray, it's automatically synced to Maven Central. Um, yeah. So you did a couple of things. You uploaded to your JCenter account. You need to click Add to JCenter. You need to wait for approval. But all of this is sent to you by email, so it doesn't really matter uh, if you forget. You'll get an email with a notification, hey, you forgot to do this. Once you have uploaded something, they can remind you. Um, and click. Okay, so this is how the Maven, uh, this is how the JCenter page looks like when you upload. So I have different versions. So it's 1.1, 1.1, 1.2. One, 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 it's just for a simple library. You have all the versions uploaded, and you have your Maven, Gradle, Ivy dependencies. So, and you can just paste it in your README. Um, yeah, and then you have to. So it's linked to JCenter, and if it's not linked, there is a button add to JCenter, and also you get an email, so you won't forget it. And um, yeah, so just quickly to just quickly run through um, CI work, and you can run any CI with Android support. Uh, I use Travis because I managed to configure it to work and I also have a file that's also uploaded and it's easy for anyone to use. So if you want to use Travis, I have, a, I have it finished. You just change your data and that's it. Um, it's free. It has lots of plugins. It has GitHub integration. Uh, you can use environment variables if you want to store your secure data on Travis. and. Um, it, sh it basically assembles all the flavors, run tests, like the normal CI stuff, runs quality checks, uh, generates POM data, uploads to Bintray. So basically what I used to do manually, now I just push to Travis, and Travis does all of the work for me, so I basically don't do anything except change the version name and push to GitHub. Um, it basically does all of the work for you. Um, so other suggestions when you're integrating is run Codacy. It, it's good for code quality, it's, it has a nice badge. And you can run Code Climate. Um, it's much better to use, it's much easier to use SDK level 22 if you're running on an emulator because then you don't have to deal with permission dialogues. But if you want to deal with them, it is what it is. You have to write a lot of code for UI tests. And then you can run an emulator. Um, all of this stuff there already mentioned, then you can have branches, like everything that's normally possible in any normal project, you can also do with your library. It just works. So just interesting stuff for Travis. It's basically you need to accept all the licenses. This is what I lost, like I lost weeks on this to figure out how this works. So you need to accept all licenses because Travis installs all Android uh, frameworks each time you run a job. 
it's weird, but it's like this. And also, this is how you specify what to run. You just specify normal Gradle tasks. And if you want just tests, you can run tests like this. It's just some interesting stuff that needs to be done in order to get the library uh, automatically built and published. So if you don't want to do this, you can ignore all the, uh, all the tips. So you can do it manually. It's not a problem. And yeah, basically that's it. And what I want to say is um, I, I'm working on a solution that would do all of this, actually do all of this configuration from the command line. So a, a plugin, like a program, where you would run your uh, command, maybe like configure for Android library upload, hit enter, and it would ask you in a, like a conversation way, give me your name, give me your developer ID, give me your artifact ID, and then generate all of this for you. But it's not done. It's gonna take like a month or so. Until then, you can check out the blog format of this talk and get all of this data. Um, but yeah, I hope I'm gonna finish this, um, this script soon, and this will hopefully become much, much easier. Um, until then, well, thanks for listening, and hope to see you guys in the lobby. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yep. You get, our assistants uh, can help you to ask questions. You get, you get presents. So, top three questions get a present. conference so well That's it? Okay. Okay. So the first question is, did you have any problems with your project when Google bumped minimal version for SDK? Uh, okay, thanks, one more. So, no. Um, because I previously always targeted the last SDK and uh, if this was not the case, um, your libraries are usually built in a way that is backward compatible. Who's, who's asking this question? Ah, you, okay. So libraries are usually built in a way that, are, that is backward compatible. So if you think about this in advance and you build a library, um, you can target like API 15, I don't know. But um, I always uh, targeted like the latest version of SDK. But um, if you target any lower version, then you need to take care of this in your library. There's, there's no work around this. Okay. Uh, is Travis capable of running Android tests, instrumentation, or just unit tests? Who's? Ah, okay. Uh, yes. So the trick is to make it run in an emulator without the UI and without the window. There is a flag when you start up the emulator from the command line. You can start it with a special flag that uh, runs it without the UI. It doesn't render anything because Travis is, it's a Linux environment basically, but um, it doesn't have 
any UI capabilities. So if you run an emulator with, with UI capabilities, it would crash it. Um, so there is a flag, and it's also available in, in the script uh, that I uploaded, and you can run anything. But it's very difficult to run, um, like for example, tests with permissions. It's very difficult because it's somewhere out of si outside of system UI somehow I've had many issues and I realize I don't, I don't care about this. I just want to run um, API 22 for, unit, uh, for instrumentation tests. For unit tests, I run it with, if I use Rob Electric or something, and then I can run it with um, normal SDK, whatever, 26, 27. But you can run it, you can run, and it's painful, but you can. <laughs> How to take care of uh, native code in published libraries. Whose question? Ah, okay. Um, I actually only once published a library with native code, but, and it was published to our local Maven repository. So basically, I think it was just packaged as, an dot, as a dot .so um, file, and then from jar, you would somehow reference it, and it used to work. Did you have other experience? It didn't didn't work for you, or it did. Yes. Yes. I think I think that's more of a question for the Android uh, packaging plugin the one that packages everything for upload to Maven Central. For us it was working because we only targeted like one specific, it was ARM7, I think, and that's it. And maybe uh, like API 21. At, at the time I was do, were doing work on the native code. And um, yeah, I, but I think it's more question for the Android packaging plugin. So if they can package it in a way that Maven understands, um, you can do it for each platform. And you can actually report, like, open uh, an issue on the GitHub page for this plugin. They are really responsive. They respond in like one day. So um, you can, even if it's not working out of the box, they'll be probably want to help you. So, yeah. and next one: Is there uh, is it possible to remove your library once it's uploaded to JCenter and so on? Yes. Um, you can write to, whose question is this? Ah, you can write to support uh, of JCenter and also Maven, Maven Central. Uh, to, on Maven Central you need to create a Jira ticket. On JCenter there is a message box on the top. So you can just um, send them a message. Hey, I want to remove this library. It will, like, tomorrow or the day after, it becomes unavailable for everyone. But there's an issue if people already used it. It's usually stored in the M2 cache on each machine. And if they have a cache on the network somewhere, it will be cached on the network. So it's kind of, you unpublish it, but people still have it. So that's something to think of. Um, could you please give an example how we can use Maven for internal libraries? Yeah, so you have to download, whose question is this? Ah, so you can, you need to download, this is actually a very common use case in enterprise um, teams. So you have to download and set up a Maven repository server on your uh, on your network somewhere, and you have to manually upload live, or you can build a plugin that does it for you. But you can't use the JCenter and Bintray plugin. You have to just package everything on your own, and then upload it manually to your local Maven repository. Um, it's more manual work, but it's usually something that companies that care about security do. So it's a bit more involved, but it's possible. Yes. Um, we used to have it for for this native library that I mentioned. We used to host it only locally, and you upload it manually. Um, it works, but it's manual work. Um, hi, my name is Daniel, not mine, but the guy who's asking. As you know, Google could start replacing Android uh, for five years. What do you think about this fact, and what? Uh, will you do in this situation, improve Android libraries or use Fusion OS? Uh, whose question is this? Ah. Um, I don't know. In five years, 
I don't think they can replace it in five years. They can start replacing it maybe in five years, but I don't think, like, they can't replace API 15, 12, 10. It's still like 2%, 1%. And I doubt that they can replace Android that quickly. But if this happens, um, I don't think Android libraries will be compatible, like, out of the box with Fusion if it comes to this. So I think we'll have to build a library in a different way, at least. And I think it's, if you want to publish this, you'll probably have to do it from scratch. And I would honestly prefer to do it from scratch. If we have a new OS, I'd rather have it built correctly from scratch. So my personal preference would be to build a new library. Um, for now, many Android libraries have difficulties with migration to Android X. Ha! Yes. Is there any specific action for library maintainers to do uh, this with migration for users? Whose question is this? Ah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you can use Jetifier in your own library and then migrate everything in your library. But this is what I was talking about. So you have to take care of app compat, Kotlin version, and all of these things, like when you're publishing a library. My personal preference is to let the user of the library decide uh, which version they want to use. So if we're talking about app compat, like I say use app compat 25, and in my readme, I say please use app compat 25, because it creates less issues for me as a library maintainer. Previously, I used to package app compat with my library, and then I had lots of issues, like ah, I have duplicate resources, I have to run ProGuard, I don't want to run ProGuard, ah, you now my app is like 20 megabytes larger, whatever. So more issues came out of packaging uh, app compat with the library. But Android X, it's totally different, so different packages, and you will definitely have duplication. So like you can, Say in your README, I use Android X. Before using this library, please migrate. I, I don't know. I don't know. I have no other suggestion. It's tough times right now for Android. Um, okay, so this is this is all the questions. Um, anything else? No? And I need to pick the top three. So the Android X is definitely um, one of the interesting things. Um, and then um, how to use Maven for internal libraries. This is also interesting because I think many companies will want to do this once they figure out they can host their own stuff locally and it's an easy way to distribute code um, across teams. So this is, I think, also interesting. And there was one more that I really liked. Um, yeah, the instrumentation tests on Travis because I lost so much time trying to make it work. So yeah, these are the three Android X and uh, internal Maven and instrumentation on Travis. Okay, thanks guys. <laughs>